Öncelikle hocam hoş geldiniz. Hoş bulduk. Ee, şimdi hani şöyle bir grad talks e, amacı nedir? Biz neden buradayız? Biraz hani ondan söz etmek isteriz e, elbette ki. Biz Fen Bilimleri Enstitüsü olarak e, bu dönem e, şöyle bir konuşma serisi düzenlemeye başlayalım dedik. Bunun amacı da hani az önce Farkan Hoca ile e, de hani böyle bir konuştuğumuz gibi Ümidimiz hani lisans üstü öğrencilerin aynı zamanda e, üniversitemizdeki akademisyenlerin şöyle bir bir araya geleceği, e, şöyle bir akşamın işte hani böyle çok da geç saatinde değil, şöyle işler bir yoluna girdikten sonra saat beşte bir bir araya gelelim. Olabildiğince disiplinler arası e, konuları, çalışma alanlarını ele alarak bilimsel bir tartışma, e, şöyle bir paylaşım ortamı e, geliştirelim istedik ve bu amaçla bir konuşma serisi başlattık. Ee, bu konuşma serisi kapsamında da ilk konuşmacımız çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Ee, Profesör Ambar Caferi, e, Estonya'dan, e, Tartu Üniversitesi'nden bir profesör. Yapay zeka alanında çalışıyor. İlk konuşmacımız olmayı kabul etti. Ee, hocamız aynı zamanda e, bizde e, Yıldız Teknik Üniversitesi Bilgisayar Mühendisliği'nde de sağ olsun bu dönem davetimizi kırmayarak kabul etti ve Bilgisayar Mühendisliği'nde yapay zeka ile ilgili de bir ders vermekte. Kendisine bununla da ilgili olarak çok teşekkür ediyorum. Zannediyorum burada onun dersini takip eden öğrencilerimiz de bulunuyordur. E, memnuniyetlerini e, e, ders dışı zamanlarda e, duyuyoruz. E, kendisine çok teşekkür ediyoruz tekrar. E, şöyle bir isterseniz hocam ee, sizi ben bir tanıtayım yani şu e, tanıtım afişinde e, yazdığı üzere tanıtayım tabii ki hani sizin hakkınızda söyleyecek anlatacak konuşacak çok fazla e, şey var ben sizden özellikle hani 10 sayfalık bir özgeçmişinizi değil şöyle bir kısa özet bir e, özgeçmişinizi rica etmiştim siz de böyle bir tevazu yaparak gerçekten kısa bir özgeçmişinizi bizle paylaşmışsınız. Ee, şöyle bir hani İngilizce yazdığınız için İngilizce olarak devam edeceğim. Professor Ambar Jafer is founder of the Intelligent Computer Vision Research Lab at the University of Tartu, which is the first and largest computer vision lab in Baltic states. He is a director and chief data scientist at PVC Finland and has been a visiting professor at Loughborough University, London and Yıldız Technical University. He is an IEEE senior member and the chair of the Signal Processing Circuits and Systems Solid State Circuits Joint Societies chapter of the IEEE Estonian section. He received the Estonian Research Council grant and the Scientific and Technological Research Council of Turkey uh, in 2015 and 2017 respectively. He has been involved in over 20 international industrial projects. He is an expert in computer vision, human-robot interaction, graphical models, and artificial intelligence. He is an associated editor of several journals, uh, such as SIVP, Information, Entropy, and JAD, and has been lead guest editor of several special issues on human behavior analysis. He has supervised over 20 master's students and eight PhD students. He has published over 130 scientific works. He has been in the organiza organizing committee and technical committee of conferences. Uh, there are too many conferences written here. So uh, he is in the technical committee of several conferences. He is organizing a challenge and a workshop in several events as well. Uh, he is co-founder of IVCV, leading AI solutions for HR, uh, Alpha AR, uh, EU, leading 3D content generator and find session, first discovery search provider for e-commerce. Uh, hocam, kısaca anlattıklarım sizin özgeçmişinizin tabii kısaca uh, diyebileceğimiz uzun bir parçası uh, gibi oldu. Ee, sözü çok fazla uzatmak istemiyorum. Vakit çok kıymetli. Sizin de vaktiniz çok kıymetli. Buradaki herkes de sizi dinlemek için burada. Ee, bu sebeple sözü size veriyorum. Katılımınız için şimdiden e, ve söyleyecekleriniz için şimdiden çok teşekkür ediyorum. Tekrar buyurun hocam. Ben teşekkür ediyorum. Ee, merhaba arkadaşlar. Sonumum İngilizce olacak. Yani Birçok kelimeler Türkçesini hatırlamıyorum. Ondan dolayı İngilizce konuşacağım. Welcome everyone. 
Uh, thanks for attending to this uh, session. Uh, I am Shahab, as uh, uh, Zainab has introduced me, and I'm a, a professor at University of Tartu, and I will talk a bit about myself uh, later. But today we want to mostly focus on artificial intelligence, and in there we want to uh, talk about uh, responsible AI, which is known as RAI, explainable AI, which means XAI, and then the application of them in affective computing. So we will introduce all, each of these terms today and we do lots of uh, examples and hopefully you will enjoy uh, seeing some of these uh, nice examples. So the agenda would be, I introduced, um, Zenab was uh, introducing me, but I will quickly go over, over them uh, in one of the slides, talk about AI, uh, RAI, XAI, and also talk about the, uh, the affective computing, which is human behavior analysis, and also talk about uh, emotion recognition, about the works that we are leading European-wise or, or uh, worldwide um, yeah, in, the, uh, in, in my lab. Uh, as you notice, I have a very long name, but everybody knows me as Shahab, especially in Turkish, we have Tustukşi Shahab, which uh, people can remember my name uh, very easily. I am a professor of computer vision, as I said, in the University of Tartu. I am the founder of uh, Intelligent Computer Vision Lab, uh, which I'm heading it right now. At the same time, I am the director of AI and uh, chief data scientist at PwC Finland. And I am actually handling all the uh, AI development in the Nordic, which means that uh, Norway, uh, um, Sweden, Denmark, and uh, uh, Finland. Uh, I am a visiting professor at your university, Elisabeth University, this semester, and I am teaching uh, a course called Artificial Intelligence. And I have super smart uh, students there. I'm very amazed with them. And uh, I am also an AI advisor for several venture capitals in Estonia, Germany, and Finland. Uh, I have been elected thanks to students several times as best lecturer in my, my faculty. I am a PI and co PI of over 20 industrial projects being funded by companies such as Rakuten in Japan, Pitsme in the UK, and many other companies in, in Estonia and in Finland. Uh, I am also an IEEE senior member, and I think anybody in the field is we, we would find proud to be a member of um, IEEE. I am co-founder of three startups with an evaluation of five million, uh, eight million, five million, one point five million, uh, right now, and I'm also uh, uh, owning an AI consultancy, uh, which I am consulting uh, several venues such as Estonian Police and Border Guard, and so on. Uh, I have been involved in various cost actions, and right now I'm also representing uh, Estonia in uh, some of these cost actions, as it has been mentioned here, mostly focused on artificial intelligence and computer vision. From research perspective, I heavily work on affective computing. My research work knows on the affective computing, facial expression analysis, human behavior analysis, action and activity monitoring, but I do work on biometric recognition new modality on biometric recognition. In the today's talk, I will give an example of one of them. Uh, I have done and published uh, quite a lot on image processing in there, focusing on super resolution and, and remote sensing. Uh, we, in my lab, we have a branch which, working, which are working on the uh, virtual and augmented reality. We have several funded uh, EU proposed projects uh, on, on that. And also we do some work on the communication. However, today, uh, I would talk about artificial intelligence and uh, we want to understand what the AI means and have a good grasp of that definition. And in order to talk about that one, we need to uh, kind of understand very well how the whole, uh, new human uh, intelligence uh, would work. Now, um, in order to uh, understand that why we even have this field of research, I think a few statistics would, would, would help us. Uh, based on Gratner, by end of uh, <coughs> 2022, we will have uh, uh, the contribution of AI in the society to be close to 4 trillion US dollars. And again, by end of 2022, it is expected that AI will introduce over 130 million new job uh, application positions. So people who have this AI. 
But in order to understand this AI, this robot, which is doing the, some works, we have to also fully understand how the human intelligence work. Human intelligence, which sometimes when you are comparing it with the intelligence of the machine comes a little bit below. The reason that I have these two picture is that to um, have the next definition of AI based on this understanding of human behavior. The term artificial means in opposed to something that natural. So when we say artificial intelligence, it means that we look at the natural in intelligence. We see that how human understand and analyze uh, uh, the mechanism and the things and <coughs> they, how a human is making a decision and conclusion based on that one. Then we try to make a machine or a robot or an agent to do the same thing. So in other words, we are helping machine to do human-like decision-making or human-like activity. Of course, when we are talking about this one, in, we have to understand that there are various risks which are associated to uh, this AI. This risk can be divided into two levels. One is about application-level risk. And application level risk, we are dealing with terms such as parameter, such as security, and such as control. So we are dealing with questions like how we can uh, improve the, the level of safety and security of the AI that we have. How can we show, assure that the AI is not acting in a bias form? How fair is the AI is? Or we will answer the question that how we can, we can improve the uh, a human understanding of the decision-making made by, by, by uh, AI. So in other words, how we can assure that if you are using AI, you understand clearly that how AI has came to you and made a one particular uh, um, uh, decision. Then the second way of uh, considering this risk is goes in the enterprise and the national level risks, which we are talking about the ethicals, the economical and societal aspects. So we are talking about the questions that how ethical the behavior of the, the, the robot is, and even how uh, uh, these ethical rules are, have started to add a value to the uh, uh, company or organization that you are using AI. Each of these ones can be talked in details and I don't want to bother your time with them. I talk uh, quickly about a few of them and provide a few examples. For example, when we are talking about the performances, we need to, the risk that exists with AI is the concept of the, the biasness. So in other words, the bias means the AI, because we are providing lots of imbalanced data to the, to the agents, will start to learn things with some uh, um, bias towards one particular heavily oriented data. For instance, this is a real example that's happened with uh, one of the solutions that FBI used to use. Um, and it was like by looking at image, it was saying that, that how risky is this person is. And then they showed that the AI have been heavily biased towards uh, or against black people. Here is the picture of two criminal people. They are as risky as both of them are, are. One of them is a white man and another one is a black woman. And then uh, the AI said that the black woman, because she was black, AI was triggered by the, by the color of the skin, is a riskier person than the criminal, which was um, a, a, a white man. So this is actually a start to play a very, very important uh, role. So we have to be assured that it's a risk that you are providing a data. Your algorithm is perfect, but because the data that you provide will affect in a very a negative form. If you have never used artificial intelligence, you can consider artificial intelligence as a kid. If the, you are teaching bad words, bad thing to the kid, when the kid grow up and start to introduce an impact, he or she will always say bad words, do the bad thing. It doesn't mean that the kid by nature is bad. It means that the type of input that you provide is bad. But if you have a kid and you start to provide lots of good examples, put him or her into the top universities, studies very well, then he or she became in an age to start to introduce an impact to the society that will introduce positive um, uh, impacts. 
The other risk which exists with the AI is the security aspects of it. And the most famous version of that one is adversarial attacks. So what is adversarial attacks that makes the AI to be a bit risky and that it needs to be assessed is this. You know that we, have, we are in the era of internet and we have heard of the term that hackers were hacking the things. Hackers were coming to your account and read your emails and so on. But now that AI has start to kind of make a decision, then there is a new way that hackers start to, to attack the AI by manipulating the uh, input data. So in, it's called the adversarial attack. This means that AI works very well. Nobody will go and change anything, any codes of the data they, uh, uh, or AI. They start to fake the input data so that the AI is dealing with a fake type of information and, that, and then it make a decision. So AI thinks it is doing right because the input that it comes, it thinks it is okay. For instance, they can provide lots of, do lots of adversarial attack to self-driving car and cause an accident because the uh, camera, let's say, thinks that it is a green light whereas it's a red light and it makes the car to, to, to drive. These are actually very important. You might have heard of deep fake, which is swapping the face of the people and or creating some speeches and says sentences from someone famous, which has actually not been said. So there are lots of, <coughs> and it has introduced lots of uh, job opportunity. There are people who are working in that one. And the other one is that uh, having a good understanding that- Mama having a good understanding that how AI will be able to create a meaning to the terms. So in other words, the decision makings can be, can be very visible. In there, in there we are, we are, somebody is talking in the background. Yeah, that, that's okay. Uh, in there, there is one particular type of issue, which is called the, uh, the rogue AI. No, rogue AI, uh, could you please uh, turn off your microphone if he was talking? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, sorry, sorry for interruption. So, um, rock AI, rock AI means this: that uh, you are you have program your your, uh, your your algorithm. Everything is super cool. So you are expecting that it will behave according to some constraint. However, what will happen if for whatever reason, uh, your AI start to misbehave? You said that this is a, it detect the traffic light, it detect that this is red and it has to stop. So what will happen if it will become wild and then it wants to actually drive when it is red? So and another issue is that what will happen if uh, the AI understand that something is wrong, but it is not interacting with it? Like the AI understand that this is red and it should not drive. What will happen if it start to drive? So these are the risks which are associated to the control and need to be uh, addressed. This being said, it means that we are not dealing with AI alone. We are dealing with a concept which is called responsible AI. And nowadays we are seeing that the big fours, the majority of the scientists are now trying to work on this responsible AI. And when it comes to matter of responsible AI, we have to have a good understanding what it means. And in order to tell you what it is, we have to tell what it is not. Responsible AI is not an ultimate solution. It is a collection of solution techniques and tools. It is not about the technology, but it is about the harmony which is between the governance, the people, the tools, the techniques, the processes are. It is not about the, the code of conducts, the AI ethics that we are describing it. It's about how we are utilizing all of these rules in order to make them to be relevant to the application. Definitely, it is not something new. It has been there forever. And it is now we are just trying to utilize it in a better form. 
And it is not about how uh, the model should behave after we build it. Responsible AI means from the first moment that you are taking your data and you want to do the data pre-processing till the end, there are some fairness, no bias over the data. And in order to assure that this responsible AI concept is being implemented, we need to, we can do the division or introduce three different priorities. One priority goes for the ethics and, and societal uh, aspects, which means that we have to assure all the ethical <coughs> aspects in Europe, we have the GDPR are being preserved from the beginning until the end. The other one goes to the performance and security. In here, we are talking about the bias and fairness. If, for example, you know that there was a very famous court case, which actually the court settled, that the court settled on 19th of November, 2019, so almost about one year ago, and it was with the Apple card. Apple introduced a credit card, which you could apply for credits with that one. And then later it was shown that the algorithm, which says that yes, you will get a credit or not, is uh, gender dependent. If you are a female, you have lower chance of getting the credit. So there was a big court against that one. And then they, they, they, they find out and they try to solve the, the issue or the fairness regarding to the race, as I gave you the example of that one. This means that the data should be uh, correct. It means that the AI should be able to understand if there is some imbalance things inside our, our, our data. Another aspect of this is being able to interpret and explain the action of the, the AI. Currently, one of the reasons that the big industries hesitate using of AI is like this. AI acts like a black box. Some input comes, some cool output comes out. But people feel scared because they don't know what is happening inside here. So it is like a, a, a magic box. Imagine there is a black box. And you, when you are putting your hand in, you hear a very nice music coming out. How many of you are daring to put your hand inside that black box? Although you know that as an output, there's a nice music coming out. Because you don't know it, you hesitate to use it. Now, that's why that people are working on something which is called XAI, or in other words, explainable AI, in order to reduce the gap between human, and by human, I mean normal users, not educated ones, to grasp better and, uh, of this AI and reduce this gap, which is between the uh, artificial intelligence applications and the, also the uh, human users. And that's why that many people says, oh, everybody are listening to me. They are hearing me. Uh, I, I turn off this phone. I will not use uh, Google Home and so many, so many uh, other things because it's not explainable. In other words, if AI says that, yes, this is a black pen, it is very required that it will be also explaining that why I am calling it the black pen. This is something that in the uh, people who are working machine learning will say that we show the activation map. And another thing is the robustness and the security as I already described and provide you the example. And then the third category, which helps this responsible AI to be implemented and helps with the, explain, helps with the explainability is the concept of the governance, which is over the whole, whole data. Now, AI, as I said, is like the human brain, right? Uh, and I gave that if you want to understand AI, thinks about the key, how, what you give to the kid, how it grows, it will be reflected in the future of the, the kid. Now, so it means that AI is like a brain. So when we have our brain, so everybody has a brain, but some of you are become musician, some of you are become historian, some of you are become mathematician, some people are become drivers and so on and so forth. And it simply means the reason that somebody is a carpenter and I am not, it means he or she has learned those skills and I have not. So it means that how the application that we are doing, the AI can do something if the learning happens. So how I am become a teacher and somebody else become a carpenter is because we have done different type of learning. 
as AI is artificial, so we have, we need to do some kind of learning. And it means that we need to teach a machine how to learn. And it is called the machine learning aspect. There are in general, uh, various <laughs> way of conducting learning as you, some of you might already have known. It. Some learning happens like how a teacher is teaching us. You know that when we go to the school, a teacher is teaching us a new word. They describe what is a new word. They are teaching off the additions. They say that here is the two apples. I give you one more apple. Now you have three apples. So they teach us things with the labels, with the, with the lots of guidance. In machine learning, the way that machine learns, this way of learning is called a supervised learning. Or we can have the unsupervised learning. Like if you are traveling around the world and you go to a country without knowing their language, then you start to understand or guess what some word means. Nobody is teaching you and you try to discover it. So we can make the machine to learn it uh, uh, like that too. Or we can learn by, by getting a, a, a, a award or, or a punishment. It's like this, your kid is doing something wrong and you tell your kid that was very bad and you are punishing the kid or he or she is doing something right without you telling them and then you start to, to award them. So this is also something that we can tell the machine to learn like that. It's called the reinforcement learning. Of course, there are lots of new aspects that are introduced on daily basis, thanks to Amazon, to Facebook, to Google. These, there are lots of advancements that are happening, such as uh, federated learning, which uh, is now, especially with the 5G coming out, it's become very much popular. So this was the general description of AI, a general description of how AI will learn. And I want to dive into the topics that we want to talk more in details. And it is something Shana which is Pujan. called- yes. Shana Shana Pujan. Pujan. sorry ah. for interrupting. Hocam. Hocam, how are hocam, hoş geldin. Hoş bulduk. Arkadaşlar selamlar, araya girdim böyle dersi bölenler olur ya. <gülüyor> Nasıl geçiyor? <gülüyor> İyi geçiyor. Kağıtlasın soğuk mu havalar? Estonya'da <gülüyor> soğuk ama kar yok hala. Geleceğiz ha. Bütün bu ekip kaç kişi var şu anda burada? 140 mi? 150 kişi. Tam 150 kişi Estonya'dayız. Abi bu dersi bir de orada almamız lazım yerinde. <gülüyor> Tabii ki buyurun. Yıldız Teknik Üniversitesi'nin çok önemli bir enstitüsündesin. Fen Bilimler Enstitüsü. Arkadaşlara teşekkür ediyorum bunu düzenleyenlere. Hem Zeynep hocama. Teşekkür <gülüyor> Murat hocam var. Murat bir daha verdi. Ee, emeği geçen arkadaşlar, mutfakta çalışanlar. Ee, bu Great Talks çok acayip bir şey. Herkes burada konuşmak istiyor. Şah, ilk senle başladık. Ben de yer bulmaya çalışıyorum. Ee, bana da yer e, ayarlamaya çalışıyorlar. Gerçekten Great Talks'ta konuşma yapmak çok ayrıcalıklıdır. Zor bir iştir. İyi hazırlanmışsın gördüğüm kadarıyla. Ben şimdi çalışıyorum. Ocakta falan bana bir yer ayarlasana. Ocakta boş yer. Olsun. Ocakta da ben varım. Ee, seni geçmem lazım. Şimdi dinliyorum seni. <gülüyor> Senden daha iyi olacağım. Ciao. Olur Hadi sizden iyi dersler. Ben, Arkadaşlar. Ben sizden olur. Selamlar, sevgiler. Tamam. Teşekkürler. So I will keep continuing. So I, I want to talk about effective computing. And uh, what is effective computing is this. I'm sure everybody knows psychologist uh, or you have met a psychologist. So psychologists look at you and try to understand your behavior. My field of research is like this. I'm trying to teach AI. I'm trying to teach artificial intelligence to understand human behavior. So it will make your, your, your car understands you better and help you to have a better driving experience and so on. So effective computing means enabling AI to do a human behavior in a way that a human does to a, to a human. So we want to talk about the human behavior analysis for the rest of today's talk. Why human behavior analysis is important? It's because we are living in a society which is called aging society. Obviously, Turkey is a very, very positive country, but most Europe are living at our negative countries per se that the populations are getting old. Now, the problem with the aging society is that the people are getting old and they don't have anybody to take care of them. 
we don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough nursery places and so on. So that's why that actually creating a, ro a, a, a robotic system, which will become the companion to the human will become very important. So being a companion doesn't mean that next to me there is a robot. It needs to interact. It needs to create me the feeling that I am not alone. So it has to tackle the loneliness. And in order to tackle the loneliness, it means that you have to talk to the robot and the robot should understand that you are in a happy mood or something is bothering you or you are stressed. So it has to understand so many things. In order to be able to improve this type of interaction and to bring it to the level that human does, we need to uh, dive a little bit more into the human behavior as human rather than before talking about the machine. The interaction that we human are doing is mostly emotional based. So in other words, there is some emotion in that particular interaction. It can be uh, hatred, it can be joyful, it can be a, a, a surprise, it can be neutral, but there is something inside it. We as a human, we are the master of this type of interaction because we are, uh, we can use lots of sensors in our body in order to understand. Uh, here, we can do the hearing, we can see, we can get the smells, uh, we, can, we can understand the gesture of the person. So based on that, we can have lots of mobility to come in. We can look at the context and understand that what is the emotional state of the person. It is very culture dependent. For example, um, I, I, I spent over 10 years of my life, I grew up uh, most of my life in, in, in, in Cyprus. Uh, like in, in Turkey. So you see that the people are very much warm. Uh, when you want to say hi, you are kissing each other. You are very active. We are very active when we are expressing our emotions. So around 10 years ago, when I came to, to Estonia, which is the North Europe, I start to have a bit of shock because there, the people were completely comparing it with, with the, let's say, a, a Turkish culture or South Europe culture are very much in a cold or no emotion region. Of course, Nordic people are known for not being able to express many of their emotions. However, after 10 years, you can understand the people here can be also happy, they can be sad, they can be angry, but the way that they are expressing it is different. So in other words, expression of you, uh, the emotions is very culture dependent. Of course, we have also this physiology of the body that we need to know. For instance, uh, if, if I tell you that be happy, most of us are opening our mouths to show the, the smile. But what will happen if some of my muscles are not functional? So it means that the way I'm expressing happiness would be different. And finally, if for instance, we know that there are some people who might have some, some uh, brain disorders. Brain disorders is like autism. These type of people, they are very normal. The only difference is that the way that they are expressing the emotion is not the same way as the normal people are expressing the emotions. So emotion is very complicated. We are affective computers, so we want to have some solid definition of the emotion so we can teach it to AI, because otherwise it will be very complicated. That's why that in the community of <laughs> affective computing, people said that we are using uh, one famous psychologist work called Paul Ekman, who said that, hey guys, we can divide the uh, uh, emotions into the seven uh, clusters. And based on that, we can uh, say that, yeah, a person is angry or have a, a feeling of uh, happiness or sadness and so on and so forth. So lots of people were, including me were working on that one. Then we were facing one issue. And the issue was this question, are these seven emotions realistic? I mean, if we had a very interactive class and I was there, I would really ask you to raise your hand and tell me that if you think these seven emotions are realistic. Um, the, the reality is that these seven emotions, unfortunately, are not realistic. And then the question that are these seven emotions enough if I want to express some particular event, then the answer would be, uh, not yes and not no. It will be partially, it depends on the scenario. So in other words, what Paul, what Paul Ekman said, it's not realistic and it's not enough to express the emotion. And let's give an example about why we say that this is not realistic. 
Imagine you love someone. You love your wife, your husband, your partner a lot. Like you love this person. And you have been together for, for 10 years. You really love this person, right? And then in the morning you wake up, the person, your wife, your husband, that you really loved a lot, you look at through his eye, her eyes, and then the person says, you know what? That's it. They break up. I don't love you anymore. So what would be your emotion at that, that moment? Let's say that you will become sad. You will become very unhappy because the person that you really love and spent 10 years of your life says that he or she doesn't love you anymore. So now you are very sad. You are getting out of uh, home. You are very sad. You are walking and you are passing by one of the kiosks and you get one lottery ticket and you scratch it and you see you have me, you have win, let's say 10 million Turkish lira. So what is your emotion at that moment? You have won 10 million Turkish lira. Now, if you are like me, you would be very happy. I mean, you won 10 million Turkish lira. And if, but the reality is that even uh, I win 10 million Turkish lira, there is a sorrow and sadness, which is coming from the morning because let's say the person that I love said that I don't love you anymore. So I have a mixture of these ones. Of course, I, let's say I like money more, so I will be very happy, but the sadness is there. But maybe I'm a very emotional person. I win the money, I will be happy, but the sadness will dominate more because I still feel the sorrow or pain of this, this breaking up. So in other words, we said that in the reality, people have actually something which is called compound emotion. Compound emotion means people are living with a mixture of the emotions on momentarily basis. But this mixture is divided into two. One of the emotions are dominating. I love money more than anything else. So when I win the, the money, I would be very happy, although there is a sorrow. Because imagine the story that I told you now in this form. You wake up, the person that you love look at you and says that he or she loves you. You are very happy. You leave and you go and win the 10 million Turkish lira. So you see that. They, you do, cannot be in the same emotional state. One of them comes with the sadness and happiness. The other one is the happiness and the ha extra happiness. So it means that people are having this compound emotion. Luckily, we are able, psychologically it has been proved, and luckily from the machine perspective, we are able to find something which is called macro expression. And from there, we can find out that if a person has a, a, a combination of these emotions. There are some works, some, some uh, uh, scientists in US, in the University of Utah, who have started working on compound emotions. And around uh, three years ago, in my lab, from Europe perspective, we were the first lab together with University of Barcelona, and University of Alborg, which we started to work on these compound emotions. With the help of psychologists, we created a database, a big database of over 30,000 images that we were training the people, we were training over 150 people there to express uh, 50 different emotions, which are like a combination of like, let's say, sadly happy, sadly surprised, and so on and so forth. Psychologically, in the 2020, uh, the most of this compound emotion that we are living is a sadly, uh, happy or happily sad. So in other words, we have these positive negative combinations because we are, as a human, we live with the history, with the memory in, in, in our head. And that's how the emotions are being uh, created. How we created these emotions, we use these uh, Ekman uh, seventh emotions. Then we create this cross table. And then from here, we calculate that, we, uh, that they, we, can, we can ask the people to expose this combination of 49 emotions plus one, which is the neutral. So we are the first in the Europe, which are now able of doing these 50 category of different emotions. The work has been published in IEEE Access and it can be uh, seen. It was also announced as a challenge uh, twice in the Face and Gesture Conference and many people participated. And we had people from Turkey who were participating as well. Now we did this compound emotion. We find it very exciting, very interesting. Then we start to talk with the psychologists to see that, okay, what other cool problems is, are, are there? And in there, we start to find out that, huh, 
there is an issue and the issue is that uh, what if people are hiding in front of the camera the emotions that they have remember the problem was one thing it was, i want the robot understands me so what if i tell lie to the robot by telling lie is that i had a very bad day today i was very sad but i tried to smile in front of the robot so what well, how can we make the robot or let's say that i am using the ishbank uh, uh, uh, um, app but uh, i have some stress how can the camera understands how can the uh, camera captures and ai understands that i am under stress because maybe somebody is behind this camera and pointing a gun towards me and forced me to do the bank transaction so how can we understand this type of blocked and hidden uh, expressions so this started us to create and tackle a new challenge and it was finding out the fake emotions psychologists were working on it for a while but from affective computing perspective it is relatively new and uh, why it is <coughs> important because it can increase the level of reliability of the ai so it is helping with this concept of our ai which i introduced at the beginning of the the talk so question is how to detect the block or unblock of an emotions two ways one way is that you are by help of the psychologist as a psychologist they they talk to you they look at all the micro movements that you are doing and from there understand that they said that oh please i understand you are you are blocking something in your chest speak about it or sometimes they say that oh you are exaggerating calm down so in other words it's unblock means you are exaggerating block means you are keeping something inside it now we want to make the ai to do uh, that understanding of course in order to do it we have to have a few understanding of human uh, actions one fact is we as a human we do not see each other uh, we, we do not see our face we see each other's face but we do not see each other uh and we see each other but we do not see uh, uh, our own face and that means that we have no good understanding of how we can move the, the the things which are on our face for instance now let's let's do an exercise let's put our hand like this on top of one another in front of our own eyes and let's try to open our hands for 1 cm i hope you you are doing it because my question is that how good do you think you are in opening your hands for about 1 cm i believe maybe 95% of you are almost accurate within plus minus few millimeters and why because we are all coming to the age that we have seen what is a 1 cm so we can open our hands for about 1 cm without having any issue one of the muscles that we can move in our face very well is the muscles around the eyebrow we can move our eyebrow very well now i ask you can you please move your eyebrow for 1 cm all of you can move the eyebrow but you absolutely have no idea of how this 1 cm is and the reason for that is you have never trained your brain with the movement of the muscles on your face that's why that if you are going to the uh, uh, acting classes in acting 101 they teach you this sit in front of the mirror and play with your face so you are giving lots of data to your brain so it can learn let's do another uh, test george colony is very famous with his smile so look at the <coughs> you have to do this experiment with your friends and this is a real experiment psychologists have done it and maybe you have done it also before look at this smile try to mimic this smile and the moment but don't look at yourself the moment that you think you have his smile ask your friend to take a photo i can tell you that majority of you will go and delete that picture after you see how you have created it and the reason for that is again we don't know how much you have to to move uh, your your lips your your uh, squeeze the corner of your eyes in order to create that particular um, uh, smile either you will underdoing it 
you feel you have done it, or you think you have not done it, you overdo it. And because of that, you cannot make it. So we saw that this exists. And then we said, okay, we wanted to work with these uh, fake emotions, but we saw that this exists. Then we find out something very interesting. We collect a data and we show that by looking at the change of the emotions, we can understand who you are. So in other words, people are capable of showing their uh, capable of uh, having a unique way of showing an, an emotion. If we have a sequence of emotions from this change of sequence, we can understand that who the person is. So we can use it for uh, verification. And we conduct it, we publish it in, in, in 2018, and we saw that the performance is as high as or uh, close to 99%, which is very good performance. Now, we, we, we did these things, we had an understanding that, okay, the face, we don't have a control over that one. Then we said that, let's do a further study on the fakeness of an emotion. Then we wanted to do the study of that one. We wanted to teach the machine. Then we find out that we don't have any, any data. So we, we said we have to create the data. Now, in order to understand how to create this data and how to measure it, we need to do a little bit of biology. It's not my favorite topic, but, but this is something very interesting. You know that our brain works with a pattern. This means that if you are hearing a pattern, after some times, you do not realize you are hearing it because your brain is start to filter out that pattern. It learns the pattern. So one thing is that if I tell you that smile and you smile, then I tell you that now I smile, you smile. Smile, you smile. Smile, you smile. And now I said that cry. After several times of I tell you a smile, your brains get this pattern that it has to smile. So as soon as I open my mouth before the word comes out, because you know that the, the, the vision works with the speed of the light, at least to capture, and then we are talking about the mechanical sound. So there is a little bit of difference. So as soon as my mouth starts to move, your brain already has this pattern. So everything, let's say, is in your cache. The cache of the computer means that the part which works very fast is actually the spinal cord. So in other words, it quickly says that, okay, get ready because you have to smile. So all the signals comes uh, that squeeze these muscles, squeeze the corner of the eyes, open your mouth because you want to smile. But I tell you cry, now your brain gets a new data and it starts to send the comments that, no, no, no, don't do that. So you have to, start to put your, your corner of lips down and start to act that you are crying. Now, why I'm telling this in a slow motion is that if we will be able to capture things in the magnitude of milliseconds, then we will be able to see that there are changes that wants to go towards happy and suddenly they change. So in other words, there will be a dramatic change. Normal eyes cannot see it but because it happens in some <coughs> milliseconds. So then we find that, that this, bi this biological uh, uh, bottleneck exists on human. Then we start to collect data using 100 frames per second. And with the psychologists, we create a scenario. We told people, be happy, be happy, be happy, be happy, be happy. And then we told them to be sad. Now, the moments that I told them to be sad, they already wanted to be happy. They were expecting to be happy. So in the first tens of milliseconds, we can see that there is a dramatic change. In other words, people start to fake it. So then we start to understand where the fakeness happened. And then we start to teach the, the data. So we were using lots of opposite uh, uh, uh, emotions. We were, in order to invoke the uh, uh, positive emotions like happiness and so on, we were using lots of YouTube videos. So we were creating the uh, atmosphere that people were acting the first emotion properly. They were in the mood of happy and then we will ask them to, to, to become sad. And we are the first lab and research group globally which collected this data. We had 54 samples almost equally distributed between the uh, uh, genders from age 19 till 36. And we were collecting the emotion, these fake emotions 
of the, the people with 100 frames per second, and every video was on the average of three to four seconds. But we understand the fake has happened within these first half a second anyway. Now, Samsung, for example, has, has purchased our database. They are using it, so there are researchers in Korea now who are working on that one and so the reason that we stick with the age 16 to 36, uh, 19 to 36 was that as we are growing up, we become older, uh, we become better uh, in, in hiding the emotion. It's not that we become a better liar. It's because in general, our response time will become slower. Even if it comes from the espinal cord, it's still it's way slower that the brain can dictate. So that's how, why that we did not keep the database to include very old people. Now, here is an sample. In the first row, you see a real anger or active anger, and the one below, it's a faked one. We understand when we are, um, a person tries to fake an emotion because they don't have a control over these muscles, they start mostly to overdose that action. So what I mean by overdose is this, the most famous uh, uh, uh, fake emotion that people have worked on it and they can recognize is happiness, fake happiness. Fake happiness is work like that. Then I tell you that, please be happy. What happens, you are opening the corner of uh, your, your mouse and then you, you smile. But one of the way that the true happiness happens is that when you are happy, you are start to squeeze the corner of your eyes. If you didn't know it and you know it now, so it means that if I tell you a very stupid joke and you want to laugh at it, you will smile and you will start to squeeze the corner of the eye. This time what happens, you will start to overdose it. You will squeeze it too much because you don't know, have a control over, over that one. And this has been actually shown by our, by our AI because we are working on the explainable AI. This is something which is called the activation map. You see the face of the person, the parts which are in the high color, like red, <laughs> yellow, or green, it means are the part which are activating, which are telling AI, hey AI, this, please announce that this is a fake happiness. And as you can see, eyes are those parts which are heavily helping AI to understand that somebody is having fake happiness. Of course, this, this also, it triggered us with a further dive inside a, a, a research, which we call it understanding of this block and unblock emotion. Uh, we started around two years ago for 18 months, we were collecting the data. We have the data, we are now doing some processing on the data and soon we will publicly uh, let the people also use, use our data. And why it become important? Earlier, I told you that I'm also consulting the Estonian police and border guard and in there, we find out something. You know that if you lie to the, to the police forces, to the law enforcement, uh, you go to the jail. Lying to, to the law enforcement means jail. But sometimes we have different scenario. If you do not tell the truth, you don't lie. But if you don't tell the truth, legally, nobody can put you into the jail. But by not telling the truth, you are actually helping the criminals by slowing down the process. So by understanding, by making an AI to understand how human is blocking or if an emotion is blocked, we can raise a flag and say that this person that you are talking to is blocking something. It doesn't mean that the person is lying. Maybe he, he forgot or maybe for some other reasons, not helping the criminals that are not saying, but the flag will be will go up that this person is kind of blocking and um, a special type of feeling. Uh, this is a very uh, important topic because uh, in the database that we were collecting, we take into account the personality of the candidates, we were collecting the EEGs and so on and so forth. Of course, we said at the earlier stage that human, when, when we try to interact, we are uh, interacting emotional base and we as a human understand people's emotions using various modality. And here and from there, we can understand somebody have different type of emotions. And in our work right now in the, in the field of uh, affective computing, people actually conducting multimodality on recognition of the emotions. 
For instance, in my lab, we have heavily worked on understanding of emotional states of the people, not only using the facial, but we are using also the audio. And we are also using the gesture of the people. And from there, we understand what is the emotional state of uh, a person. Of course, uh, when we are talking with the audio, I'm not talking about the words that I'm saying. I'm talking about the intonations that I have, the, the formants that can be measured and so on. Of course, you can take it into account also the words that I am saying. And from there, you can have even a healthier understanding of what is the emotional state. And that triggered us to uh, work on integration of this vision and language in order to assess the first impression that the person has. First impression means like this. Many of you are seeing me for the first time and I'm talking for five minutes. And after that five minutes, the impression that I'm leaving on you will consider as a first impression. Maybe from there you say that, oh, it seems that Shahab is a very, let's say, extrovert person. It doesn't mean I'm extrovert or not. It means the impression that I left was like that. We did that assessment. Actually, we participated in one particular uh, challenge, uh, which was on the uh, job interview screening by YouTube. And then it motivated us to <coughs> establish a company called IVCV. And the company is a spin-off from, from my lab. It's a, a startup from, from my university. And in there, what we are doing, we are assessing the uh, in can CV of the candidates. So rather than writing a CV, you are uploading your video, which you are describing yourself. And there is an AI who is assessing uh, the, the video. From there, AI looks at your video and tells you that what are the instant emotions that you have, and it shows you as you see on the top right uh, uh, chart. It really listen to you and look at what are the words that you are saying, and from there it is extracting the skills that you have, as you see that the person has SQL, Oracle, database, Java skills, and so on, and also it assesses the words that are being said, are they the positive words or are they negative words? You know that the words in general can be divided to positive and negative with different weights. So from there, we can have a good understanding and understand if the person is, for instance, a good person to become a salesman because we are expecting a salesman always use the positive wording or maybe the person gonna be a programmer so we don't care if it's positive or negative. Now, right now, if somebody wants to apply for a job, there is this HR agent should read the CV and then contact you. And after contacting you, talk to you in order to create this one. Now our AI is helping these HR people to look at this dashboard in one go without contacting the person and understand that, okay, this is the right person so I can go and talk to them. It doesn't mean that you should hire or don't hire the person. It just shows more information. So this is the explainability of AI. Of course, we utilize this one, not only at the HR level, for instance, we can use it in order to assess the employee performance. Because let's say that you are working in a bank, you are working in, in Turkcell and you are talking with the, with the uh, customers. So it's important that your manager be able to assess that how good you are in your job. So it can be actually utilized. And uh, based on that, we can understand that what, uh, how, how, how good or how positive you are while you are, you are talking with the, with the customers. Right now, I personally, with my lab, uh, we are working on a few topics, but similar to many uh, researchers in, in Europe, and some in US, we are heavily oriented on the concept of explainable AI, XAI, and responsible AI, RAI. In other words, we want the people not only use the tool, but the tools tell them that how it happens. We are investigating right now heavily on understanding the gender bias on AI algorithms, age bias on AI algorithms, and also we are conducting research in order to see how fair AI is. Right now, as we are talking, some of my, my lab members are collecting data. We have lots of African community students. So we are taking pictures of them. So and we try to do a benchmarking of that on recent algorithms, how they are behaving on the people of darker screen. So in order to, to see how fair they are.
And uh, furthermore, we are also conducting some, some research work on the affect, uh, a combination of this affective computing and uh, education, for instance, using it in the, in the augmented reality, in the virtual reality, and so on. I hope that you were not bored. Uh, and this was the last slide that I had. And I would be happy to be able to answer any questions that uh, you might have. Uh, actually, I would like to ask questions. You yeah, sure. Dr. Shah, uh, first of all, I thank you very much for this beautiful, helpful and holistic speech. And I speak uh, for myself. Your speech was really inspiring and revealing. Thank you so much again. And also, okay. I would like to, and also with this opportunity, I would like to thank the organizers of this event. And I strongly and pertinently wish such organizations to continue in Yildiz Technical University. My name is Farkan Yilmaz, and uh, I'm, uh, I have recently obtained the Associate Professor title in wireless uh, communications field. And I am working on the probability and the stochastics theory. And uh, currently, uh, when I work with my students, I ask one question. I, I, I ask uh, what the uh, I ask what artificial intelligence is, and what first what intelligence is, and what artificial intelligence is. For these two important questions, my answer uh, I imagine uh, I describe these two uh, questions with this example. Let us consider a mother and her child. And we know that her child is a boy and very naughty. Let us close our eyes and let us imagine now. And we will think that this boy is standing on a high wall and jumping there. What can we guess or what can we imagine first about this kid or this child? Because he is so much naughty and he's a boy. I think we think first uh, the child will fall. So this is our guess. And then we take some measures to protect the child. For example, we try to save him. So from this point, I have two definitions. Because I am an engineer, I'm, uh, my special field is the communications. And intelligence is, this is my definition. Intelligence is an ability to evaluate and predict the probabilities of events. I give the definition in terms of probability theory and statistics. So intelligence is an ability to evaluate and predict the probabilities of events. And what artificial, artificial intelligence is? Artificial intelligence is a system or mechanical system or programmable system. It is a kind of system that can evaluate and predict the probabilities of events. So my question is here. So, in your research is really, your uh, talk is really uh, beautiful and helpful and holistic speech. And uh, uh, so how could you define these events? So uh, what kind of techniques you are using to define the events? So based on the events, we can, by observation, by observation we can find the probabilities or we can estimate or predict their probabilities. So is there, so I think I am talking about a general approach or general method. So I would like to hear your comments about my definitions also. Your definition is, is a, a good definition, but when you are describing this example, what comes in my mind is things such as an unsupervised learning, which is required in order to cluster the event into different type of event and based on that some action will happen or it is similar to what we are dealing in the reinforcement learning, which means that we are actually let the event happen. And then from that one, we are learning. So next time we are type of kind of avoiding. And this is how actually the human does. As you just said, there is a naughty boy on, uh, on the top of the, the, the wall. The first thing that we think that is that he wants to jump. And the reason that we are saying this sentence is that based on the past data, we know that that can happen. And if suddenly the kids decide to sit down on the wall, then we understand that our decision was wrong because he didn't jump. And then in other words, we start to learn and so on. So this is how the reinforcement learning, for instance, is being, being formed. So for such a solution or assessment of such events, 
in my opinion, typically something such as uh, algorithms that we are using for unsupervised learning or reinforcement learning is the, the right tool to, to go ahead. So uh, how can we define the granularity of the detecting the events so or the accuracy of detecting? So is there any approach? Uh, well, uh, the, what, when it comes to matter of talking about the accuracy of the algorithms, typically we are doing it with the sets of data that we already have in our hand. What, because you know that when we have a data, you are dividing the data in the three uh, subcategories, yes. the, the training, the uh, validation, and the test. So you trust your test to be a healthy test. So the numbers that it will reflect would be reflecting to the real world. You are never using your test in, during the training and validation. So mm -hmm. once your system is ready, you are conducting your test and you see that, okay, uh, let's say that uh, a, a 89 percentage of the time it is acting in a way that you want it. So when it comes to the real world, you really don't know unless that the event happens and the, the AI make, make its decision. But usually in order to report it, we are creating this uh, silver bullet test, I call it, which is usually includes the challenging problem. You will never use them in order to train any of your AI but you always use them in order to test to see that how they will perform under the different conditions and so on and so forth. Oh, thank you. Thank you. In, in addition, I would like to ask one more question. Sure. So uh, do you, can you give some applications of AI about uh, wireless communications? Uh, well, like I have 5G, not, 60. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, I personally have not used it, but there are quite a number of uh, application of it in the telecommunication, yes. for example, for crunch uh, uh, as, uh, estimation uh, when the, in, the, in the telecom communication. Another one is that, you know, you have different bases and then you are, you are you, when you are talking on your mobile phone, you are switching between them how the switch happened, which one of the bases it has to connect, you can develop an algorithm which learns over the data and from there it will, it will do it. Because remember, all the learnings that we are doing is it somehow is one optimization problem and we try to kind of optimize these, these routes and the process that we are doing. And I know that it is currently is being happening when you are having this multi multi agents and you need to communicate between them or you need to switch between them. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shah. Uh, so there is another question as well from uh, Yusuf Agas. He raised his hand first before Muratoja, please. Uh. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shaha, for this uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I'm a student of civil engineering, but I have interest in AI and computing, so I follow it from that point of view. I have just two questions, uh, and I'll be really short to uh, express myself. So one of my questions is about the uh, about being how good are we? We talked about the mixed and compound emotions, but before that, we have the other emotions. So it's the first time that I'm hearing about compound emotions, but I want to know that. How good we are right now at judging or at evaluating with precision the normal seven emotions of EEG? Because, because uh, th there's a famous saying that goes about AI that before you tell the machine to know that it is a husky, you should first let it know that it is a dog. So, so how well we are at that stage? That's my first question. Uh, we are in a um, um, good uh, level of understanding of the emotion of that uh, state of a person when it comes to the uh, seventh uh, basic emotion. The problem happens in a fact that emotion is not a discrete event. It is a, a regression problem. It's, it's analog. You cannot draw a line to say that this is a happy and this is a surprise. You are below the line, you are happy, you are above the line, you are, you are surprised. And because of that, we have always this gray area between the, each of these emotions. Now, when we look at the performances, you know that we have various uh, famous uh, databases like uh, Kohan Canada database. The databases that we have collected are not being heavily used and they are all being labeled by psychologists. And people look at those labels, look at those data and do the tests. And based on that, they are providing some, some performances. Then 
because there was this uh, idea that the, the problem is regression, nowadays people are not talking about these seven emotions. They are not talking with, about the compound emotions. They are talking about uh, uh, arousal and valence, which means that we are talking about that, okay, Yusuf, you have a happy emotion and it's very extreme. Like in other words, you have lots of, uh, you have a positive emotions and it is very extreme. So we are talking about positive or negative and how much of it, uh, of that one we have. If you have no negative, no positive, and you are neutral, uh, you, you have no, no height, it means that you are neutral. So then happiness and surprise are extremely positive and anger and sadness are kind of extremely negative. So people are creating now this uh, um, continuous map and they're mapping it in there. And their performance, as I said, are good. Why I don't give you a number, it depends on what scenario you are testing. But typical good algorithm has a performance around 80%. Like mm -hmm. if you are happy, you see that it shows you also happy. So that, that, that, that's, that's good to know. My second question, I'll be really quick. Uh, you talked about the ability of machines and the ability of AI to recognize fake emotions and fake reactions. An automatic question rises at this point. How, how, where are we standing? What's our standing on the ethical point of view on this? Because the society as we know, uh, I have read a little bit of uh, psychology. So the society as we know, it stands on a balance between expressed emotions and suppressed emotions. So don't you think that with the AI recognizing even the suppressed emotions, we are disturbing that balance? No, actually, uh, we have to notice that the, the, the, when it comes to matter of the ethical or responsible AI, uh, we are using AI as a tool to flag. So in other words, if AI looks at me and says that, yeah, it seems that Shahab is, is faking his content, let's say, it doesn't mean that Shahab is faking his content. It means that I have rows enough features which are triggering the AI to say a sentence like this or rise a flag. Actually, this uh, is quite positive when we are looking at it from mental health monitoring point of view, in a sense that if we are able to uh, understand if somebody, somebody is surpassing some of this emotion, it means that it, in the long run, it can cause some psychological <laughs> or mental... So, somebody is drawing some some pictures on the on the thing, but that's okay. So it, it can cause this type of uh, uh, what's called uh, uh, mental uh, illnesses later. So actually, it is quite quite positive from social perspective. Okay, okay. So it, it comes down to where it is used and where it is not used. Absolutely, but but it it, it gets it comes to, uh, into this. You said you said that uh, uh, you are you are civil engineer, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, with high probability, you are also studying that how you need to maybe destroy one bridge because you want to build a new bridge. So the question is that destroying the bridge, how ethical it is? Well, it is very good because you want to build a new one. What will happen if you are doing it for a very bad purposes? Mm -hmm. So, so or, or you are learning physics, this is very good. You want to help the people. What will happen if you are using it for creating uh, uh, mass destruction uh, equipment and killing lots of innocent people. You see, there, there is this, this big, big dilemma, but yeah, it, yeah. it ended to the application. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shah. It was really interesting to hear to you and from a uh, point of view from civil engineering, it was really enlightening for me. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Yusuf. Uh, and the second hand was Ab Wahid. Actually, the second hand was Murat Oja, but since we are the host, I'm not giving the word to him. So, Ab Wahid. Uh, uh, I can't see you. Thank you very much for giving the mm -hmm. opportunity. <clears throat> My name is Wahid. I am working with Dr. Firkan Yilmaz. Uh, just he asked her some questions about wireless communication and AI. My question is basic, like, you know, nowadays, uh, as you said, we are talking about levels of AI. When we talk about the first level of AI, like narrow AI, why we just do the things, AI is doing the things what humans do. But when we go to the third level, like uh, super AI, which is, of course, hypothetical. Uh, what do you think about this hypothetical AI? Is it going to come or like, is it existing or are people working on this hypothetical AI by machine? Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Uh, you know that one of the things is that uh, the technology is developing significantly as you are working with this uh, uh, wireless communication with Hyper-V, you are aware of this 5G. And uh, because of the, the bandwidth and the fast connectivity that it introduced, actually there is a type of learning which had, has started to be introduced. It's called set-rated learning, which is aiming to that. Federated learning is something that maybe you have seen in the uh, in the Hollywood movies that let's say FBI is looking for me and in order for them to find out they connect to the old phone around open their cameras microphones and they start to find out that where, where, where shop is located. Uh, this is not in a movie anymore. This is actually it's called federated learning. There are a few startups which are working on the federated learning. It's super expensive in communications and it helps. They are hoping that 5G will solve the problem. They are looking at like lots of these devices, huge amount of data in order to assess. So it, it is coming, but this is not a scary thing to come because this actually will simply lead into a Better life, faster life. Of course, we are assuming everything we'll use in the in the good form. But again, when you are talking the word term hypothetical uh, AI, so it depends that what you mean. Do you mean the AI which uh, understands that ten years later what's going to happen with your bank account? So with high probability, based on your your last ten years of your life, with high probability. Uh, that will not come soon, and I don't know even if somebody wants to work on, on that particular topic of uh, predictions and so on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I was talking about, you know, where the machines can be self-aware, you know, uh, where they can... The machine can what? Self-aware. They will be self-aware about themselves. Machines or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, right now, actually, you know that there are... For, for many years, there are AI codes that they are coding. So in other words, they can, there are a, an AI algorithms which are doing the coding. So in other words, they can code something of themselves. But one thing you need to always keep it in your mind, no matter what type of learning algorithm you are doing, AI use the learning algorithms, which means that it looks at the patterns and it learns from the patterns and it generalizes based on patterns. So my friend, let me tell you something. If one day AI start to take over the earth and wants to kill everyone, yeah, the only way to survive, question. the only way to survive is to do completely different things that you were doing. In other words, why I'm telling you this, this example is that breaking the pattern would be the, the, the way to, to go over it. Right now, AI is capable of writing a book. AI is capable of writing a code. So it means that it could become advanced in future, but it heavily depends on the pattern that it learns. Because of that, it is expected that it will not be able to create something which is better than the, that code itself as one pieces. If you put the whole pieces together, maybe it will become, but you require one external force in order to put them together. But I, I personally have never worked with, with uh, such topics. So. Um, my answer would be limited to that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Doc. I have another question, but it's not a question. Just we can have a discussion, a big discussion. Like, you know, last time, Elon Musk, what he did with the peak, you know, about, you know, neuroscience, we say it as a black box. There's a lot to do in the neuroscience, as you said about That's the true. emotions. Yeah. Uh, so what he did about the pig, he put the chip inside his brain, inside the pig, and he saw how neurons are moving inside there, how they are doing the movement. So is it possible, you know, are we going through like to the stage where we can do it for humans? You know, we can see the movement, how it's working inside the brain. But there are lots of neuroscientists who are actually working in line with that. Again, I am not doing any, any research in that particular field, so I cannot really comment something in, in line with that one. But I will not be surprised that soon we will see that there are lots of neural level studies coming out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Isgi, we can have your question. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to ask uh, something, this topic, do you know uh, this topic novels like uh, or series um, maybe some of us had watched the uh, Westworld 
oranalar. Uh, actually, I'm a little afraid of uh, the um, emotion recognition of the artificial inter intelligence because, uh, you know, politics <laughs> and international uh, relations are working on some little uh, uh, remaining silence or not talking or, or um, I don't know, the, the politics um, may be in danger if uh, the AI can No, actually, I can tell you, uh, yeah, yeah, this is actually a very good point. I can tell you that it's not in danger. But it seems that if AI start to become like enter into the TV programs and assess the while the, the politicians are talking and people can see the assessment, then it may actually force the politicians to have more transparency over their actions and activity that they are doing. Because uh, I don't say that they don't have a transparency now but then it will have a more more transparency what they are doing. It, it's like this, I'm talking to you and you can answer any question and you can lie because it, how can I check it, right? But what if I'm talking to you and you know that you are connected to this lie detector, so you will assure that all the answers that you give to me would be a, a truth. So it, this is how, how change that it might be introduced. However, due to the GDPR and lots of uh, uh, regulations, we might not be able to see AI to come to that level that fast. I hope it does because it is actually helping the, the life of human being. Because you can look at the AI from two point of view. One is that it's a tool that will help you. The other thing is that a tool which can violate your privacy. And I can exactly see if, because Corona was very useful for AI, it, it kind of forced lots of people to open up to AI, right? Because we could not contact each other directly. So we were forced to have this, this uh, artificial agent to, to do some of the actions. And like in early 90s, when the, when the internet came, there was lots of debates. Will the internet uh, take over of our life, uh, our time and so on? And we can see that nowadays, Many of our jobs depends on the internet. It creates lots of lots of positive things. Of course, it creates also addiction to internet, which is a negative thing. But like any other things, it has its own positive and negative things in the life. Thank you. Actually, I was uh, asking it because of the. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not always looking at from the um, bad side of it, uh, but. Um, uh, I I saw a series called Westworld. <laughs> I'm talking about. I, I will talk about that. Uh, at that series, there was a machine. Uh, there was a computer that uh, computes people's lives. Uh, but uh, he was that was doing it uh, secretly, uh, and uh, uh, that was calculating if a people uh, is. <laughs> is wants to uh, to kill kill himself kill herself or uh, it was calculating if a people's mind is uh, good or bad if mm -hmm. uh, that people is crazy or not the mental issues of that person and uh, their lives was uh, <laughs> Yani insanların hayatlarının e, tamamının belirli olduğunu, yani tamamının hesaplanabildiği, tamamını hesaplayabilen bir e, makine vardı. Çünkü elinde bütün insanların bütün verileri vardı. Bir insan intihara meyilli mi değil mi ona göre iş bulabiliyordu ya da bulamıyordu. Ya da bütün hayatı o e, bilgisayarın hesapladığı şekilde gidiyordu. Yani insanların e, tabii herkes bir şey ister ama... Çoğu insan istediği şeyi yaşayamıyordu. Sırf o bilgisayar onu tanımlayabildiği için, yüzünü, ifadesini sürekli izleyip sürekli tanımlayabildiği için. Yani bunlar böyle basit dizilerde yazılabilen, senaryolara eklenebilen şeyler. Ben e, yani neredeyse eminim ileride insanlar hani bu kötü yanlarını da kullanmaya çalışacak. Yani bu yapay zekada buna nasıl engel olunabilecek? <gülüyor> Very good question. Very good question, and I can tell you something regarding to that one. 
and it is in here, uh, then the, uh, sorry, it's in, in, in here, uh, then we are talking about the control over the, the AI. The, in the control part, the second part is called rogue AI. Rogue AI means what will happen if AI goes crazy and wants to kill all the people? How do we have a control over that one? So this is the part of the responsible AI that if we will assure that there will be another algorithm which is watching this, that in order to assure that nothing will happen. And I can tell you that in the human life, this exists. You are having a policeman, you are hoping that the policeman will save the life of a person. But in the US, for instance, you see that the policeman kills an innocent person. So what happens is that that's why that we have uh, the judges, we have the court, which is supervising this one. And if you see that the policeman is doing something wrong, they will arrest this police and so on. So similar thing actually exists in AI. If the AI is uh, uh, becoming rock and it start to kind of manipulate humans, then it can be uh, eliminated. In Europe, this is like heavily controlled by the GDPR. But regarding to another point that you said, that, okay, uh, because we have phones, I watch so many connected sensors to us. So let's say AI knows what is gonna happen in our life and so on. So how can, how, is it a scary? The answer is no. Before you, the, uh, a gentleman who was asking a question and I told him that in general, AI looks at your data let's say, and if it wants to predict about your behavior and it finds the pattern and from those patterns, it finds out that, okay, you have a potential of a committing suicide, for instance. But in order to break this, in order to make sure that the AI will never understand what you are doing, just do something which is not in your pattern because then it will make the AI, for instance, confused. So if one day that TV series that you watch comes true, in order for you to walk easily without having an interruption, just act differently than your normal time that you are acting. Then it will start to make lots of uh, uh, adversarial attack to the, to the AI per se. So then there will be uh, no, no issue from, from that perspective. But at the end of the day, uh, you, you should not be worried. So again, you know, uh, people are, are introducing the knife so you can cut the vegetables, you can cut the meat, make a very nice barbecue. And there are some people who are using that knife and let's say kill somebody else. But I can tell you in Estonia, there are some, and a startup which is using AI in order to watch this mental health patients in order to assure that, for instance, they are not committing suicide. And it is, this, is, this is heavily being appreciated because uh, sometimes they get emotionally dumb and they commit suicide when they are in a very bad depression. But imagine now AI understands that you are getting depressed and it is rising the flag to the authorities or it will try to communicate with you in order to assure that you will not go to the depths of the depression, which can be very, let's say, uh, dangerous. So it has its own positive sides too. I hope it will only uh, work on that positive sides and. Yeah, okay. hopefully. I mean, we have, we have the things in the world that we are hoping that it will happen only in the positive sides. You come to the university to learn, and we hope that you will learn and become a good scientist, but you know that we have also bad scientists too. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ezge, for your uh, question. And Ahmed Sabri. Um, Marawa, uh, my name Marawa. is Ahmed Otay. Um, I'm an electrical engineer and PhD student at Ildus Technique University. I have graduated from the United States of America. Um, okay. I'm a person who has fond of modern technology. I have a few questions for you, doctor. Uh, yes. It was an amazing presentation for the information, for the huge information that you have on this uh, seminar. But what is, what is the efficiency of this AI that you got in, in the field of, um, uh, let's say for the um, biology or psychology of the person, because um, for the intelligent agency, I can change my face or whatever you want um, by training, absolutely. So I can uh, convince, convict you to make myself happy and to let you know 
that I am happy, but in the in the meantime, I'm not happy. You, you know that the intelligent agency. How? Yeah, how absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but second question is: Does this algorithm depends on the pictures? Because if it's depending on the pictures or the video, so you need a high quality picture or video. Um, you know, sometimes the, the blurred image will affect it on the uh, quality of this uh, algorithm. I've been working with the uh, algorithm that is correcting the blurred image. So it's kind of affected on the, you know, um, that means the pixels can affect on the algorithm that you have presented, right? So if this pixel, instead of, let's say it's red and instead of it's red, it's coming like a green. How much affected on the IA? I mean the efficiency of this algorithm. And uh, you know, as I am a person living in the United States, the privacy is very important. So um, depending on the, what are you saying right now? The, the privacy, it, it will be break down, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, regarding to your, your question, you are absolutely right. One of the things that I didn't mention it because we consider it as an assumption is that the quality of the input data. So if the things are blurred and so on, we are not talking about it. As you see, for example, here, uh, the, the resolution is an HD resolution and we are dealing with 100 frames per second in order to do the assessment for the, for example, fakeness. But if I rephrase your question into this, can somebody cheat over the uh, algorithms? The answer is yes. That is exactly. As we can do it, as we can do it to experienced psychologist. You know that uh, how how this Paul Ekman became very famous was that he has started to work with the FBI. He was training the FBI agents to keep the poker face, to keep the, the neutral face. So in other words, they are not expressing their emotions. Mm -hmm. There are people who are becoming a spy and they are going over this extreme training that they can even control the, the brain waves, the EEG signals. So in other words, you are showing them it's, it's suddenly something and even they don't blink or not, no patterns appear on their EEG. They, that, those type of people exist. But right now the solutions that we are working, my startups that they are working, we are dealing with the improving the quality of life of the people under their normal life. So in the normal life, you don't go to train yourself in order to hide the emotions. I mean, uh, the, unless that you have one specific reasons and so on. So usually when my mom comes home and if let's say that uh, somebody has put some food on the floor, she will get angry and she shot. This is a very natural action that a person will do, right? Uh, and uh, our solutions are all working with those natural ones. But easy, well, uh, not easily, but you can definitely uh, create a false uh, action for the, for the camera. As you said, these agents, they can be trained, the people will be trained in order to assure that they will not be captured or caught by, by uh, AI or even by a physical psychologist who has been working in this field for let's say 60 years right so how about how about the it depends on the picture right it, let's uh, say the, the quality of the data is very important so it's affected by the picture uh, yeah we are we are we are not using only picture we are looking at the spatial temporal in other words the changes are also playing important so we are dealing with the video and as you notice, we are also using audio in general too. So we have audio visual. So from both audio and the visual and the temporal information laying in there, we are making, a, we are training and the AI make a, make a decision. That's amazing. How about the, the last question before my last question is the break of the privacy. Yeah, that is also a very important question. You know that Europe has the toughest uh, um, uh, privacy law with the GDPR since 2018 and in there uh, AI can still look at you, can still assess you if you provide a permission. So all of these ones is happening by the permission, by receiving a permission from you. So in other words like this, uh, you and I we are having a, a Zoom call let's say 
And I tell you that we can understand each other better if the cameras are open. You can say no, and you can keep the camera closed and we can keep talking. So you will not benefit from the fact, for instance, to see me if this is a, a, a, a good thing, but you have a choice. So the privacy will be violated if I do not give you a choice. If I tell you that, hey, you have to let the camera to be open because let's say AI wants to assess or you will fail the course, then it means that I do not give you a choice. And this is the way that I am violating the privacy or privacy, or I am actually recording you without telling you, asking you. So that's the, the part that is violating the privacy. But if I am telling you like most of the Apple products, you know, have these terms and condition, it is asking you, it is asking you that, hey, can I have your location? So then I will be able to tell you that uh, if, if you're passing by a gas station. So you are allowing it to know uh, your, your private information. Otherwise, there is no concept of privacy at all. We are, I mean, AI is not violating privacy on any purposes. You always permit it. Yeah, exactly. This is um, kind of one of the reason of producing the 5G, right? It depends on the huge amount of information and data. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, we are, we are 5G uh, in AI, as I said, in the federated learning, for instance, it's being used so we can uh, do much faster real-time assessment uh -huh. because uh, nowadays with the iPhone 12 Pro, you have, God knows, uh, 16, uh, 30, 100 mega, mega, mega uh, uh, uh, bits of uh, an image, 4K image, 4K videos, leader information. So we are talking about huge amount of data that need to be transferred. And all of them will help me to assess, will help the AI to assess, let's say the emotional state of the person better. And so 5G from that perspective would, would, would help, but it's not violating the privacy uh, per se. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, my last uh, uh, question, please, uh, Dr. Zainab or whatever, uh, who is responsible for this presentation, I'm sorry. I need approval of attending this seminar, please. How can I get one? Uh, there, there is no such that kind of a thing actually. But if you really like to take an attendance, then we can prepare one for you, Ahmed Sabri. Please, I, I hope so. Can I, I, say I guess you need a certificate, something like this, right? Exactly, that is true. Oh, why not? Why not? Okay, okay. We're, we're gonna do it. Please contact. Chat. Please contact with the uh, graduate studies team after uh, the seminar. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much for your question as well. Nasir uh, Sinani. Yes. First yes, of all, thank you, Dr. and Barjavari, for this presentation. And thank, thank you, Yildiz Technical University, for such organizing for such events. First of all, uh, like human recognition, stress reduction, like human activity recognition. This is nowadays, this is very, very research like. Is it, it's uh, is doing researchers are doing very uh, a lot of the research in this field, and according to your presentation and to your work right now, uh, I saw uh, cases where photographs where your dat data set the preparation is created by humans with no diseases, like with uh, humans with no problems, and a lot of work that I saw before on internet, uh, the databases that are created for such a problems, they, they don't take consideration people that have different diseases. For example, people with uh, autism or people with uh, another different problem that we have. So how AI is approaching this problem with people that have different diseases? How hard is for AI to recognize such a uh, uh, human rec like uh, like stress or another behavior is uh, in your work. Like, you, do you have yeah. in your data set people that are that has some problems and how you are approaching uh, to this problem? Yeah, actually, when we were collecting the data, we were assuring that the people do not have any kind of disorder or or physical defect. And then we it comes to matter of autism, we try to assure that the person also doesn't have the autism 
So autistic people were excluded. But it doesn't mean that they have not been studied. Actually, autism for per se is one of the well studied uh, uh, disorders. Uh, I am consulting one company in Estonia who are working with the autism. They are collecting data with the, uh, of uh, autistic people. And their aim is actually to uh, understand if a kid, an infant, when the baby is born, if he has all, or she has autism or not from the crying. There are quite a number of research uh, in University of Harvard, they collected the database of the crying of the babies and they labeled them if they're autistic or not. So the uh, thing is that sorry, the uh, AI, sorry. The question is not detecting autism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, detecting uh, like, uh, is, is, is emotion like detection? Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am, I'm coming to that point. I'm coming okay, to that sorry. point. Now, yeah. So the, the AIs that we are developing are aiming to address the people the recognition of emotion of the people who do not have any of this disorder. However, there are um, many AI algorithms which have been developed in order to understand the emotional state of the, let's say, the autistic kids. So in other words, to understand if the, an autistic kid ha is happy or not. I remember in 2013, we tried to have some attempt for that and we stopped it due to the complexity of the problem. Because for normal people, when I say that somebody, uh, happiness, it's easy to define the norm of the happiness. But when we are talking about autistic people, they have different, each of the autistic people, based on the level of the autism, they have different way of even expressing their happiness. I personally have not, I decided not to go to that field and I have not worked on that. I know that there are some researchers who are working and there are some AI algorithms which have been developed for that particular field. Their performances should be way below the performance of the current algorithm for the current norm. I mean, I, I use the word normal, I don't want to be disrespectful, but the people who do not have the disorder. And simply because the amount of data which are available for training the networks to understand the emotional state of, let's say, the autistic people, uh, is way lower than the amount of data which are available to understand the emotional state of the uh, non-autistic people. So it's all get back to availability of the data and that's why that it has not been uh, uh, studied very well. Okay. Is there any research that supports both like normal? Uh, no, uh, uh, no, because they have different nature. In other words, uh, an autistic person, if he is, uh, let's say, avoid to have eye contact and doesn't move the, the, the, the lips, which means that a normal human yeah. will be content, it can be actually surprised. So in other words, remember, autistic people have the same expressions or way of expressing things, but their emotion associated with that expressions are different. So yes, in other words, <laughs> unless I know that the person that I'm talking is autistic, otherwise I do not understand that that expression is, is happiness or a content. So that's why that the AI does not understand. If the AI understand you are autistic or guess that you are autistic, then there will be a questions of these profilizations, which we try to avoid. That. Yes, but our algorithms need to be generalized, right? <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, no. Generalized, but you have to understand the, the, the concept. Oh, okay, uh, in a sense that if we generalize, then it will be like this. Uh, let's say that I'm an autistic person. Algorithm says that uh, based on all the features, it's a content, but I am happy. So the generalization actually put an autistic person in not a good position. So that's why that, uh, for instance, in one of my startups, which we are heavily working with the human behavior analysis, uh, the people will say if they're autistic, if they're autistic, uh, we will not let the AI to assess them. And we will say that this person need to be manually assessed by the, by the HR agents. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Nasir. Uh, and one last question. I know, uh, Shahab, uh, you're very tired right now, but one just one last question from Gökhan. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a uh, great presentation, and thank you for allowing us me 
uh, these questions. Uh, I want to give you just uh, two news. One is this alpha fault. Maybe you have heard this DeepMind AI company, DeepMind, uh, claimed that he solved the uh, protein folding problem. This is very good. Uh, yeah. Can and basically solve the vaccine problem next day. If we know the protein, then we won't yeah. have any pandemic in the future. Let's say this is the good side, but I'm sorry, I have to say the other side, which is according to BBC News, there is a nuclear scientist, Iranian nuclear scientist, who was killed uh, by uh, intelligent AI-led uh, gun, satellite uh, controlled uh, AI gun, and uh, like uh, next to him, there's a 25 centimeter uh, between him and his wife. His, his wife uh, was not uh, shot, but uh, uh, like the accuracy of the model is 25 centimeter and it can kill a scientist. So is there a kind of global organization uh, like World Health Organization who can solve pandemic problem? We can discuss the effectiveness, but who can solve this AI-related crimes? Or who can benefit yeah, the yeah, yeah. AI-related Yes, this is exactly what falls into this RAI, responsible AI. You give this example of this scientist. Uh, so um, the Iranian government announced that this was an act of terror. And then the US government, uh, or at least Trump administration said that they killed one terrorist. So this is exactly questions that what act is act of crime, one act is not act of a crime. So let's put it like this. There is a war between country A and country B, and there are two soldiers. And one soldier, soldier A, kill a soldier of country B because he thinks this soldier will come and kill his family. So he protected his family. And the family of the soldier in country B are mourning and say that he has been killed by enemy, by terrorist, by whatever. So in other words, it's become a very philosophical question. I am a very bad philosopher, so I cannot really comment on, on, the, on your question, unfortunately, Gokhan, but it's a very valid question. That's why, for instance, in Europe, uh, with the GDPR, they try to define some rules and regulations that will try to uh, act on this RAI. You go to China, you see that none of them exist. I was, um, uh, I'm also visiting a, a professor in Loughborough University, London, and in, in, in my uh, course that I was talking, um, I was reading, uh, they were maybe, I don't know, 95% Chinese. And I found that opportunity to ask one question. There are lots of data which are being gathered through the phones, through many other things and so on, which AI solutions are using. And I asked this question, who should own this data? So there have been 5% British out of this 100, 110 people, there were five, six British people. They said that, oh, I mean, my picture, I own it, this own it, that own it and so on. And very surprisingly, majority of Chinese people, they said that, no, no, no, government must own it. And I said that, why government should own it? They said that, well, this is the nature. The government should own the data. So why I bring you this example is that there are different definitions that what is a norm, what is a crime, and what is not a crime. And I'm not in that position to say that what action is crime or not. Maybe um, a killing machine which kills somebody, they are actually killing a criminal. So the action that has happened was a positive thing. Or maybe it was a rogue AI and it killed somebody and, and uh, killed a father of someone. So, so it become very much uh, philosophical and I'm afraid that I don't know how to answer to that particular question. But we can definitely work and improve supervision over the AI the supervision over the accuracy that it is it is providing, improving on the accuracy that it is it is providing. But what action is a good action? What action is not a good action? Is is is heavily debatable. Uh, you know that Asselson. Uh, I have friends who are working there. They are working with these autonomous tanks, and they are going to the to the wars, and then they are killing uh, people who are attacking our country. 
So the question is that uh, who will monitor them? Well, from uh, Turk Cumhuriyeti, we say that Yasha uh, Sen Aselsan, because it is protecting our land, it is protecting our people by avoiding the letting enemy to, to come and take our uh, soil. But then the question is that, what about the person who has been killed? What about the family of that person who has been killed? So, so I think it's become very much philosophical and um, I mean, I'm an AI scientist, not a philosopher, I'm sorry. I think, I think uh, the best algorithm will rule the world, not the best country, the best algorithm. <laughs> It's going to be all between AI machines. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand Maybe. again your point, but because you know, best is again subjective. What best? What, who, what is the best algorithm? I mean, the best algorithm will be a peaceful algorithm. Says that, hey, people, please sit down, smile at each, at each other, be happy. I mean, don't don't fight, don't argue, and so on. Which yeah, I am also my pro. My question is like, I believe there has to be a, a global organization like World Health Organization who can solve pandemic problem. There has to be a, a organization related to AI. The regulation, the rules, they, they must obey the rules of this organization. Otherwise, every country trying to use or abuse the use of AI in different areas, then who is going to pay the consequences of these uh, crimes? You cannot uh, jail an AI machine, you know, we cannot. <laughs> no, no, no, no, because... uh, Gokhan, you are right. And I can tell you that this will come soon, exactly while, how GDPR came out, because they start to see that AI become a pan pandemic of AI. It is everywhere. It is violating the privacy. Then they put the privacy law. So with high probability, if not tomorrow, in next five years, I will expect that there will be rules, regulation, international regulations on controlling of the, the AI. But how it would look like under what uh, uh, framework it will be introduced, I don't know. I don't think that I will be part of it, but I understand that the demand will exist. You gave a very good example, so it will come. But um, and it's it's unavoidable. It definitely will come. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. Okay, Gökhan, thank you very much, Shahab Hocam. It was a really very inspiring uh, speech, uh, and the answers that you gave gave to the questions was also very informative. I guess uh, all of the participants satisfied. What we did for what we did today, for what you did today, actually. So thank you very much. And I guess after this uh, presentation, after this talk, uh, there are so many masters and PhD students here, you know, as the participants. So I guess they're gonna uh, get in touch with you. Uh, they're Absolutely. gonna Google you a lot <laughs> after <Absolutely>. this presentation. <laughs> And maybe there will be uh, more collaborations than uh, we guessed before this presentation. So thank you I very much. So. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I guess this is uh, going to be the end of uh, this talk. So thanks to you all for your participation. Hocam çok teşekkür ediyoruz Şahap Hocam. Ben teşekkür ee, ediyorum. Için. Çok çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Bence çok güzel bir konuşmaydı. Hepimiz çok şey öğrendik. Çok ilham vericiydi. Ee, bütün katılımcılara da ayrıca çok teşekkür ediyorum. Umarım amacına ulaşmıştır. Evet Murat Hocam da bir şeyler söyleyecek. Kısaca teşekkür edecektim Şahap Hocam. Aynı yerde olduğumuz için yankı yapıyor. Çok teşekkürler. Ben teşekkür ediyorum. Devam ettiğiniz için. Evet, bütün katılımcılara da tekrar tekrar teşekkür ediyoruz. Ee, hocamızla öyle zannediyorum ki bunun sonrasında da iletişime e, geçeceksinizdir. E, zannediyorum Şahap Hocam da bu iletişime açık. E, pek çok işbirliğinin olması temennisiyle e, bu geceyi sonlandırıyorum. Ama herkes bir kendini unmute etse ve hocayı şöyle bir güzelce alkışlasak olur mu?
Evet başlıyorum ben vallahi. Herkes unmute etsin kendini. Bir kaos bizi bekliyor. <gülüyor> Ama olsun. Teşekkürler. <gülüyor> Teşekkür ediyoruz. Teşekkürler. <gülüyor> Görüşmek dileğiyle herkese. Görüşmek i̇yi, akşamlar. Tamam. i̇yi akşamlar. İyi akşamlar.